are about to spice things up as we explore the investment landscapes of Japan and India. I think we'll come to appreciate that these two markets, Japan and India, are a bit like sushi and curry, two very distinct dishes with its own unique flavors, but increasingly very appetizing to global investors, especially as we see global investors' appetite towards China evolving, and China, for some, is becoming a very challenging dish recently. Joining me today uh, to convince you that China and India form an indispensable part of the global investment menu, I have, uh, to my left, Leon Rapt. Leon is the co-portfolio manager at the Platinum Japan Equity Fund. This is a fund with a 25-year track record. Leon first joined Platinum in 2011, but for a brief period away, he has been with Platinum since. He's a fluent Japanese speaker, had over three decades of experience in Japan equities based out of Tokyo, New York, and Sydney. And to Leon's left, we have Anish Matthew. Anish is the CEO and CIO of Sundaram Asset Management. He runs the international business with Sundaram out of Singapore. He first started his career in 1990. Uh, that feels like a few lifetimes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, he has run country funds ranging from India, South Korea, and Taiwan to APAC funds for diverse client base. And he set up one of India's very first offshore equity funds in 1995 and has been actively investing in India ever since. To Anisha's left, we have Maya Funaki. Maya, as you, some of you know, the first name itself uh, has both a Spanish and a very strong Hindu connection. Maya is a Japan equity long only manager based in Hong Kong. She started um, and spent over 10 years with RBC Blue Bay, building up the Japan strategy. She's born in Tokyo, educated in New York City, and has experience and perspective in Japanese businesses. She started a career in M&A advisory as, at an investment bank and has spent most of her career as a public equity investor. Uh, she tells me she loves karaoke on top of finding great businesses and traveling around the world. And last but not least, we have Sushan Bansali. Sushan is the CEO of Ambit Asset Management. Ambit is an alternative asset management firm in India where he has led the team for the last five years and he has grown the AUM by 10x. He has worked for 15 years with Ambit. Some of us might know Ambit as an India-focused investment bank. Most recently, Ambit uh, received an investment stake from Daiwa, which uh, is Japan's largest investment bank. So ladies and gentlemen, I think from my quick break introduction of the team, you appreciate that we have an ext extraordinary panel today with a huge depth of expertise. And it's fair to say they have, I think, over a century experience in, in the markets we're looking at, even though they look, still look as youthful as the day they started in this business. So ladies and gentlemen, if you can join me uh, as a round of applause um, to welcome our panel, please. I appreciate that. Right, let's uh, start off very quickly by asking our panel uh, just for some opening remarks in terms of the investment climate they're seeing in both markets. I'd like to start with uh, perhaps uh, Leon first. Leon, could you uh, speak to us about the current Japan's investment climate, please? Well, uh, thank you for the time today. Um, the investment climate in Japan, um, I would say, has, has improved dramatically uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, if anything, um, turbocharged by the initiatives that we've seen coming out of the Tokyo Stock Exchange, um, specifically to encourage Japanese companies to really focus on their cost of capital, uh, that's not really been something that Japanese companies have paid priority to uh, before. In fact, Japan, if anything, has been known as an economy that's defined by stakeholder capitalism. And so these are, these are very recent events, um, uh, but are events that could be um, very endurable. Uh, and we think that this is something that uh, global investors should be paying attention uh, to specifically. We're already seeing uh, the Japanese market perform particularly well. Um, a lot of that is due to these uh, initiatives and how Japanese companies are responding, mm -hmm. raising shareholder returns, buybacks, dividends, uh, reassessing their businesses, uh, looking at underutilized real estate. 
uh, as well. So that's the, definitely the response has come through from Japanese corporates, so which I think makes this feel very, very different um, to the reform initiatives and the many of the false storms that we have seen uh, over previous years as well. In addition to that, obviously, you have a, a very weak currency uh, as well, uh, and that is unambiguously good news uh, for Japanese corporate earnings uh, as well, and also encourages um, uh, the reshoring and the rebuilding of Japanese manufacturing base uh, back into Japan, which is part of the economic policies that we see evolving uh, over the next several years. Okay, thanks, Leon. I guess the, uh, the sense we're getting from Leon is this time it is different. Uh, we'll dive into that uh, in a bit more detail. Maya, maybe yeah. for your opening remarks, just your reaction, what's happening in Japan? Yes, uh, I think this is the most exciting moment. Uh, I've been managing this strategy for 10 years, and even more so than abnomics, because we are exiting from 10, 30 years of deflation. And I think that three exogenous shocks, including global inflation and pandemics, and US-China tension, those are the big wake-up calls on Japan. And that led to three endogenous shocks in Japan, including corporate governance re reform, labor shortage, and a BOJ more dovish stance. And I think if you, you know, labor shortage has been talked about for a long time, so why now? If you look at the statistics, 68 million people are, you know, the labor numbers were around 67 million people supported by women and elderly participation rate. But it reached out around 70% and maxing out. And the supply chain's restructuring and energy price hike actually led company easier to uh, pass through the costs. And in, in addition to that, the yen weakness bloat a lot of inbound tourism. However, the foreign workers number declined. So you see the gap between supply and demand here. And to, uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange reform, as Leon mentioned, that is also another driver. So if you look at uh, TSC doing uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange, restructure from Tosho to prime market, setting the standards in terms of liquidity and disclosure. They're actually setting a, a standard, and then uh, the companies are actually listening to it. And uh, they are also um, warned, sent a warning letter uh, on corporates below PBR one times. And BOJ side, BOJ wants to stay behind the curve instead of Fed going uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, that actually led to yen from 130 to 151 this year. And we assume that BOJ to stay dovish because they, wanna do, they don't want to make the same mistake again that they did in 2001. So we assume that w they want to wait until raise growth to really happen. Yeah. Thank you, Maya. Um, as I stated at the outset, uh, Japan and India are two very distinct regions, but there's probably much in common. We can come out and explore that in a while, but let's hear from Anish. Anish, what's your opening pitch for India? Yeah, thank you, Kershing. First of all, uh, personally, I'm really glad because I spent decades marketing India as an investment destination. And I'm finally happy that India is gaining its uh, spot in the sun, so as to speak. If you look at it, uh, what has caused this change from an international perspective, it's twofold. One is obviously the economic growth. If you look at India's uh, average GDP growth over the last 10 years, it's something close to about 6%. And that includes some very tough phases. You had the COVID, in that year, the GDP actually fell something like 6%. And then in 2016, you had the demonetization, which uh, upset economic growth for the brief period of time. And then you had the GST implementation in 2017, which also took some time to settle down. So in spite of that, you had very strong economic growth, and the bedrock of that growth is largely due to the strong government in place, which is leading to policy uncertainty. If you see from 2014, BJP and Modi have been in power. So you have had two consecutive terms of the same government. And prior to 2014, actually you had 25 years of coalition government. 
While growth was reasonably strong during that period, obviously because the main aim of a coalition government is to stay in power. So hence, you know, economic growth was not a priority. So what has happened now is that you have a strong government in place and by all uh, looks of it, in the next general elections, which is coming up next year, you will have uh, the same government voted back to power. So India is in, will be in a unique place. It will be one of the large economies of the world which will have a strong government in place and policy continuity for the next five years at least. The second important thing which has emerged of late is the support from domestic investors. If you look at last year, uh, foreign investors net sold something like $16 billion in Indian equities. Historically, such a big selling would have led to a 20-25% fall in the market. But actually, the Indian market in rupee terms finished up last year in spite of this net selling. And the key reason is the inflows from domestic investors. See, Indian investors are very underinvested in equities. Less than 3% invest in mutual funds. If you look at total mutual fund uh, AUM as a percentage of uh, bank deposits, it is only 20%. So as wealth grows, this flow from domestic investors is only going to increase. And that is really providing support for the Indian market. Thank you, Anish. Um, let's check in with um, uh, Shushan. Shushan, uh, congratulations. Uh, I mentioned Daiwa took a stake in your uh, Ambit uh, business and it was executed very rapidly. So what's your opening pitch and uh, for global investors to care about India? Yeah, no, I think uh, Anish put out rightly that the continuity of policy and the surge of domestic investment uh, has led to superb returns. I think uh, last nine years we had uh, the benchmark uh, headline index has given positive returns. I think none of other indices globally have done uh, and delivered such good returns. One of the peculiar reasons I would say is threefold. India is a vi very vibrant democracy. There is a rule of law which governs the country, which leads even the political establishment or the bureaucracy not to go back uh, to what the government has laid down as policies. And third and most important, I would say, the increasing Western influence on consumerism in India. So trioka of vibrant democracy, consumerism, as well as rule of law is what is leading the growth. Uh, we are probably not the fastest in all the years, but amongst the most consistent in growth. The country has been growing between six to eight in at least uh, 18 out of the last 20 years. And uh, that says a lot that uh, stable uh, tortoise sort of growth versus uh, many other uh, fast uh, growing countries, which has led to a lot of uh, inflows and uh, uh, the other point as Mani Anish rightly put down is the surge of domestic investors and that's true not just for public equities but even for private equity as well as venture capitalists. A uh, lot of capital is now available where new and new businesses are getting established. Uh, lack of capital probably was the biggest reason behind lack of growth in India uh, 10 years back. For uh, the first 60 years post-independence, I think uh, most of the entrepreneurs led the capital. And that lack of capital is now suddenly rebounded and uh, anybody and everybody can start a new venture and get funded uh, quite easily. And in fact, what we saw that uh, in the funding winter uh, globally in the last couple of years, there's still many businesses in India domestically funded which have been able to scrape through. So those are the two points I would like to make uh, in addition to what Anish said. Right. Sushant, thank you for that. I think an uh, interesting thread that emerged from that, uh, certainly speaking to Anish and Sushant, is obviously the role of private capital in India, uh, particularly in the areas of private credit. So uh, please grab both gentlemen if you'd like a follow-on discussion. So I think we have heard the uh, opening pitches from our panel for India and Japan. Um, let's dive deeper into some of the issues. I think it would be very interesting maybe to start off with trying to understand the connection between Japan and India. And I would like to ask Anish, uh, perhaps to take us to, in that direction, uh, about the Japan-India connection in terms of government and corporate investments. Anish? Sure. 
Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, Japan and India is long having had very strong relationship. I remember in the early 80s when the Indian government set up its first uh, passenger car vehicle manufacturing outfit, it chose Suzuki as the uh, partner. And over time, the government of India has exited that venture, and Suzuki is now the majority shareholder in that company, Maruti. And Suzuki's 56% stake in Maruti is now actually worth more than Suzuki's market cap in Japan. So that's a very interesting thing. And similarly, you know, when the two-wheeler Indian uh, market opened up to foreigners in the mid-80s, you saw Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki enter the market. And now there's something like 1,400 Japanese companies registered in India and operating in India. If you look at bilateral trade, it's something like $22 billion on an annual basis. Japan is the fifth largest uh, FDI provider to India. And on a G2G basis, the relationship is even stronger. India is the largest recipient of ODA assistance from Japan. And some of the marquee projects in India, like the Western Dedicated Freight Corridor, the uh, Mumbai Ahmedabad uh, uh, you know, bullet train, and metro work in some six cities, all are being sponsored by the Japanese government. Well, thank you. Thank you for framing the uh, discussion. I think that's uh, quite important to know, uh, the bridge between Japan and India. I would like to go to Maya. Maya, you are an active investor in Japan equity for a while, so I'd like you to maybe expand and share with the audience what you're seeing in terms of economic and market trends. Maya? Yeah. So the, the first thing I just mentioned, it appears to be short-term uh, recovery from COVID for some people. But you have to really dig deep in terms of what's really happening in Japan. What Japan has, what has been engraved in Japanese society for the decades. So I would say the three hierarchies, three strict hierarchies that are actually causing the visibility in capital market and labor market, which is, uh, I would say, the, the customers above suppliers and the corporates above shareholders and the employers above employees. So the first thing, customers um, above suppliers, this actually prohibit uh, companies from increasing the price and also pro pursuing the profitability. And we, ha we don't have a major religion in Japan, but if there is one God, it will be customers. So for, for instance, omakase, sushi, su uh, if you go to like sushi restaurant and sushi chefs, actually proud to serve you 5,000 yen sushi for decades. And that's the kind of mentality. And secondly, the corporate, um, in terms of employer, over employees. The lifetime employment, you know, no wage growth, um, no complaint because of lifetime employment and seniority matters, um, the face time matters. So these actually prevented blocked wage growth, labor mobility, and also productivity. Lastly, the corporates over shareholders block the sharehold, increasing the shareholder return, as well as ROE growth. And there's another saying, corporate wrong belongs to whom? It's employees, not shareholders. So these kind of things, I think those are suited for uh, craftsmen, you know, manufacturing driven economy. But actually the, these walls have been collapsing. And now, the, given the COVID, the company used to, actually before the COVID company used to have the old SKUs and then for the perfect customer services. But during the COVID, they couldn't do that. So they didn't do it and then they made less, they increased the price and then they realized, oh, why didn't we do this before? So they made, they actually increased their wage, but still the profitability was higher than ever before and ROE improves, and the uh, market booms, consumer sentiment improves. So this 
we were seeing the beginning of this virtual cycle in Japan. And the most important thing, I checked with corporates, uh, they're saying they would never go back to the previous strategy again. So this is actually very structural. Thank you, Mayo. So uh, we're not diving deeper into our discussion. So from uh, Japan, let's uh, go to India for a moment. Uh, I want to go to Sushant. Sushant, maybe you can uh, take us uh, into an examination of the specific sectors in India that um, may present interesting investment opportunities. Sushant. Yeah, so I would say that uh, probably four broad themes which define investments in India, uh, whether you take equities, public and private, you take uh, credit, or you take uh, uh, sort of government support. First theme is, of course, consumer because it's a growing market per capita of GDP, which used to be $500 uh, till about 20 years back, is now close to $2,500. And very soon as India grows to $10 trillion in the next 12, 15 years, it will go to five six $6,000 uh, per capita. So increase of consumption, this all will be mostly discretionary because the basics are already sort of taken care of. The population growth has sort of dwindled down. It's less than 1% for the last few years. So whatever additional spend in this GDP growth will be there will be in discretionary side of consumer or probably the organized side of the con uh, uh, staples as well. So that's first broad theme. The second theme definitely in any growing economy has to be credit led. So banking and financial services, insurance, these will be uh, probably the next uh, set of opportunities. Whether you look at credit growth, whether you look at penetration of insurance, uh, et cetera, that offers another great investment opportunity. The third will be exports. Uh, last uh, 30 odd years, traditionally it has been more of IT services and a bit of pharma and increasingly a bit of chemicals. But uh, the common focus, especially with the structural reforms on some schemes related to uh, PLI, et cetera, has led to a lot of uh, manufacturing exports also. Apple has been manufacturing and exporting a lot of iPhones now. Uh, in fact, uh, we used to be an importer of iPhones and we are now a net exporter of iPhones uh, in the country. So increasingly, lots of manufacturing exports uh, will be the theme. And fourth and most important, I would say, is infrastructure, where many global investors, a uh, lot of Canadian uh, investors, lots of Australian, lots of American investors, are, and uh, people who are looking at long-term uh, assets uh, with a uh, high yield, probably uh, high single digit or low double digit dollar denominated growth for next 20, 30 years assets. Those are the few sectors I would say, uh, which are the key uh, thesis in the next uh, two or three decades for India. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure some of you might approach Sushan later on for uh, follow on advice on a specific investment opportunity. I should add a disclaimer. I think the organizers remind everyone that this is, um, this is not a pitch for investment, so uh, with all the usual disclaimers. Let's go to Leon. Leon, um, so from India, let's dive further into Japan. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Bank of Japan rates, the macroeconomic environment you're opening. I'd like to ask you about the uh, economic policy of Japan and its impact on uh, foreign investments. Leon? From the economic perspective, um, Japan has long been sort of characterized by having excess debt, government debt, uh, in, in particular, a low tax rate, a uh, low tax burden uh, as well. Um, the monetary policy side, the BOJ, has, has maintained uh, ultra-easy monetary policy now for uh, most of the last decade uh, as well. Um, we think that going forward, the BOJ is likely to normalize uh, monetary policy, but we think it is going to be a very slow process uh, as well. The BOJ is very aware that the exit from the strategy that they've employed um, you know, has uh, unintended consequences that they are not really certain of at this particular point uh, as well. But it is very clear that the um, uh, growth that we're seeing in inflation um, from, a com from a country that has been defined by deflation uh, for past most of the past 20 years, that change, that, that, that pivot, uh, is something that they're going to try to deal with, but in a very, very deliberate manner uh, as well. So the BOJ normalizing, you know, would take uh, 
probably several quarters, uh, we think, at that stage. And obviously, that has read through to a, a cheaper um, uh, yen in particular. The BOJ's view, we think, is that they think that uh, a cheaper currency, a, a weaker yen, is a net stimulus to the Japanese economy. And so we're likely to keep current uh, policy settings um, fairly much as they are. Uh, from the fiscal side, obviously, the, the, the Kishida administration is, is very intent uh, on maintaining uh, social security uh, benefits uh, as well. Uh, they're increasing their defense budget at the same time and trying to implement policies to address low uh, childbirth rate uh, in Japan uh, as well. And these are designed to invigorate uh, the Japanese economy through, through those measures. The other thing to be aware of, obviously, from the from uh, economic policy settings, is what Japan is actively encouraging corporations to do, which is to reshore those supply chains, making sure that tax incentives are there, making sure that subsidies are readily available for companies that actually are looking to relocate uh, back to Japan, for example. And we're seeing this very much uh, in the high-tech sector as well. Obviously, announcements by TSMC, by Sony, by Rapidus to relocate production back into Japan uh, is a very important stimulus and that's very good for uh, growth in jobs uh, it's very good news for uh, growth in wages and obviously politically is something that is is advantageous uh, as well so policy settings we think from both the fiscal side and from the monetary side are likely to to remain very supportive going forward okay something to look forward to I think uh, um, there's very good reasons to be bullish uh, about Japan uh, going forward so let's uh, Check in with Maya again, uh, just picking up on this uh, train of thought about Japan. I know both Leon and Maya, I think the sense we're getting is this time is different. Uh, uh, the changes, the real changes we're seeing, and uh, I think Maya, you make reference to the fact it's a virtuous cycle that uh, we, we begin to see. So uh, with all the progress and uh, talk about change, I guess the question is, what are the local uh, population thinking about this? Uh, what's the response from the ground uh, to all these changes? Maya? Uh, sorry, the, could you... What are the, uh, what are the changes in terms of, uh, what are locals thinking about all the changes that we've been speaking about uh, in Japan? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, so I think that in terms of um, uh, what's not priced in yet in the market, it's that um, I would say that in addition to Tosho, uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange reform, uh, corporate governance has reform has been doing it since 2013, uh, but they the corporates didn't really respond to that until recently, and it is because uh, they are proud to be in the prime market, and in order to stay in the prime market, they will do anything. So the Tokyo Stock Exchange listed uh, actually now says 31% of Tokyo Topics companies are following the guidance, but next January, actually, they're now making a Santa Claus list to which companies are doing well or not. So we'll see that name and shame really works in Japan, and that would be another driver for Japan. And in terms of sector-wise, um, uh, should I go over sector? Yes, please, if you like. Ah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of sector-wise, I would say because of this corporate governance reform, the value rallied a lot in Japan but I think it will continue to rally the next year, as well as close quality companies have underperformed. And uh, if you think of the BOJ still going in easing mode and the Fed late hike stops, and if you think of that, I think the value, the barbell style with value and a quality growth would really work. And the longer term, uh, we think that PX, GX, DX, these Japanese like to, you know, they put the acronyms or everything. And it means the digitalization, green transformation, and uh, DXGS, PX is portfolio transformation. So these uh, themes are more longer term. And in addition to that, uh, government are really think that they missed the opportunity after the US and Japan trade war in 1990s. So they want to catch up with the semiconductor technology advancement. So now if you know, as you know, the TSMC is building a factory in Kumamoto, and I visited there uh, this May, and you, you go to Kumamoto and there are rice feed field, and no one was there, but out of a sudden, a huge TSMC factories 
there. And the city is actually booming. And it's because Taiwanese land and, uh, and labor are actually more expensive than those in Kumamoto. So the sectors like that would be, uh, um, I think, the price uh, uh, drivers for the Jap Japanese equity market. OK. I think I'm sure we're all taking notes as uh, Maya is speaking about the uh, specific sectors we shall be looking at. Let me ask uh, uh, Anish. Anish, you started out uh, your pitch today by speaking about uh, India's outperformance. So I'm going to invite you to maybe expand on that, really how India has been outperforming, uh, both from a market performance standpoint as well as from a GDP growth standpoint. Anish? Yeah. It's interesting, you know, people are focusing on India now and the more recent performance of the market. But if you look at India, you know, if you look at global equity markets, there have been two markets which have outperformed over time. One is US, of course, and the second is India. If you look at the last five, 10 years, India has outperformed MSCI Equi X US by something like five to 8% on an annualized basis. And if you go back 15, 20 years, India has outperformed by 4 to 6%. So it's a market which has been outperforming not in recent times, but for a long time now. And there are two key reasons I feel that this is happening. One is the correlation between GDP growth and corporate profits is high in India compared to its peers. If you look at the last 20 years, the correlation between GDP growth and corporate profits in India is 0.62. In comparison for China, it is something like 0.45. In, if you look at South Korea, it is less than 0.2. So in India, what you see is what you get. You have good GDP growth, it translates into good corporate profits. The other important reason I feel is the cost of capital. See, India has always been a capital-starved economy. So the cost of capital in India has always been very high. So as a corporate, if you want to survive over the long term, you have to be an efficient allocator of capital. And as you know, if companies start allocating capital efficiently, it means a bonanza for shareholders. So these are the two key reasons I feel India has outperformed over the long term and will continue to outperform going forward. Okay, that's a forecast we can take uh, to the bank that India will continue to outperform. Let's uh, focus on another area. I think when it comes to technology, that's something that India and Japan shine through very clearly. So I want to ask Leon and Sushan uh, for their views on technology or the technology sector. So let's start with Leon first. Leon, maybe you can uh, share with us your insights into Japan's uh, technology sector. Leon? I think there's, uh, when people view Japan, they view it as this technology leader, in, and that is very true in a number of different areas, but there's also a number of areas where Japan is, is lagging quite significantly, uh, in particular in the software side, uh, IT services, for example, uh, is an area uh, that Japanese corporates have really neglected um, over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, to their detriment and to the detriment of productivity uh, as well. Uh, so when we view technology uh, in Japan, we view technology as, a, as an enabler of productivity enhancements. Uh, and that is something that we think really is only in the first uh, innings uh, of a significant change. COVID, the pandemic, was a very catalyzing event. I was living in Japan uh, at that time, and Japan was very... Uh, acutely reminded at that time of how analog uh, their economy was, and that goes for uh, from education uh, through to the government, through to corporates, which couldn't transition very quickly um, to remote working, for example. Uh, and so there was, I think, at that time, a, a real sense at the at the highest levels of policy setting in Japan that they really did need to refocus uh, and accelerate their uh, rollout of, of IT services as well. And so we think this is a, a multi-year process of digital catch-up um, uh, from Japan, from both the government uh, and also the corporate sector. 
uh, as well. So we, we think that also uh, the use of IT services and uh, digital um, uh, techniques is something that will also address some of the longer term demographic concerns, population decline as well. So improved productivity uh, we think is really key. In addition to, as mentioned earlier, this reshoring of, of production, there's an acute labor shortage uh, in Japan already. Uh, Japan is widely uh, known as, uh, as a key enabler of automation. Obviously, its strength in robotics uh, is very well known. Uh, and also with um, these labor savings automation, we think that is another area that's particularly interesting. Japan has world-class uh, companies that remain very, very competitive uh, in this space uh, as well. And we think those are, are opportunities uh, as well. And we do expect to see further growth uh, going forward in those areas. Right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, reminder, actually, Japan is indeed a technology powerhouse. And uh, you don't have to look any further than look at your iPhone in your pocket. The cost of materials and the iPhone, a large part of it, the sensors and the components are supplied by Japanese companies. And long before we had the iPhone, I think in Japan, we have iMode, right? NTT Docomo, that was a truly a smartphone uh, ahead of its time. So let's go to India then, uh, still staying on the theme of technology. Sushant, what's driving uh, investment in that sector? Yeah, so the definition of technology in India has been changing uh, uh, quite a lot. 20 years back, technology was known for ITES, the support services, where India became the solution provider for the world, starting back from Y2K days to then ERP implementation and now cloud migration. Uh, 10 years back, it became consumer tech, where uh, lots of uh, VC investment came and enabled lots of consumer businesses led by technology, uh, playing to the bottom of the pyramid to a large market, uh, which was combined with the, I would say, penetration of mobile phones, uh, almost 80% uh, penetration now uh, in 2022, uh, compared to not even 10% uh, 15 years back. So that has been the definition of technology 10 years back. Now, as we speak, technology is more about fintech, where bottom of the pyramid is able to access capital at uh, cheap uh, rates with the lower credit uh, cost to corporates and lenders. Uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, it will be more about artificial intelligence, big data, and using technology as an enabler, as Liam put where Japan is already today, I think five, seven, 10 years from now, technology will be the enabler for Indian businesses and any business which is not uh, technology enabled will not be able to survive. And we are going through that phase quite quickly and rapidly in India. So ITES, consumer tech, FinTech, and now uh, technology as an enabler in the next few years is how I would summarize technology investments in India. Right. Well, India, also another technology powerhouse. Let's uh, maybe in the time that we have, let's finish up uh, on another theme, which is uh, driving a lot of investment strategies and hazard a guess, it is not ESG, uh, but I rather I would like the panel to speak about demographics because as some will say, demographics is destiny. So what we're seeing in Japan is an aging, declining population. But in India, we have a young, fast-growing population. So I want to just invite the panel and um, to anyone on the panel, how do you see these uh, changing forces translate into investment strategies? If I may Anish? go first. Yes, please. Thank you. I know that's, this is what is fascinating about investing. You have two ends of the spectrum, like you said, you know, Japan with an aging population and a, a declining population. Then you have India with a very vibrant young population. But yet you find opportunities in both markets. For India, of course, it is the growth sectors because it's a growth market. So obviously you have uh, focus on growth. Japan, like what uh, Leon and Maya has been saying, there's a lot of value, there's a lot of uh, restructuring which is happening, which creates value. Uh, that's from my perspective. And if you look at, you know, the other difference between the two markets is the cost of capital, because if you look at uh, India, you have the RBI, which has been running a tight monetary policy where you have had positive interest rates now for the last seven, eight years. Uh, you have Japan where BOG is slightly behind the curve in terms of the monetary policy. So that also, you know, throws up very interesting, uh, you know, perspective when it comes to the investments. Right. Thanks, Anish. Anybody else want to chime in on the issue? Yeah, um, I think um, I 
I think it is a good hedge, you know. Um, instead of China, Japan, uh, there's a set like that as well, but also the India and in Japan. That is a very interesting, you know, good hedge combination uh, because India, as um, KS mentioned, it's a growing population and a, you have a, a little bit of expensive uh, companies, but with a higher growth. And in Japan, uh, value is, um, the PBR is, is still like 50% of topics companies are still below uh, PBR one times. So you have a good uh, mixture uh, in terms of growth and the value. And also if you want to look at growth in, in Asia, it's, it's definitely India and also some China, but also if you want to have a diversified risk, uh, more steady, uh, quality companies with higher liquidity and higher presence in Asia, I think Japan is the answer. Thank you. My, perhaps we go to Sushan and then Leon. You can show, uh, take us. I will just me. add one more point uh, in addition to the points made by Anish and Maya that uh, demographics is not just about the age but also the income level. If you see uh, where Japan is, probably the median age is nearly 50 while in India it's about 28 today. So India is almost 25, 30 years behind Japan from that perspective. Well, the other uh, sp uh, scope of demographics is about the income levels, where Japan is coming into the high level of income, while India is still in the lower middle uh, class uh, uh, from a global perspective. And the combination of uh, low middle class, growing age, growing population, with a high income society, aging society, is probably a great uh, diversification as Maya pulled out uh, from an uh, asset allocation perspective. And uh, uh, where Japan also, I think, if you look at from a demographic perspective, it uh, plays out well, is that they have been the pioneers of technology and efficiency um, uh, right from 60s. I think that's where they build their economy, that despite being a small populated country, they use their resources efficiently and taught the world how to use the resources in the most efficient manner. And that's why they led uh, in electronic manufacturing as well as chemicals, uh, metals, etc. And while India is coming uh, more from using that high level of population as a workforce, uh, not necessarily like a factory of the world like China did, but like the office of the world, uh, starting from ITS and growing from there to probably becoming the largest consumer market globally, right? And as we saw how things play out, uh, played out in China in the last 20 years, as the per capita income increased, I think similarly it will play out in India as the per capita income grows from 2000 to $6,000 and that additional three, three and a half thousand dollars of per capita income will be more consumer discretionary spent because a large part of uh, your basics are already taken care of. Thank you. And uh, Leon, maybe you find a word, demographics. Demographics is destiny. I think that's probably another area where Japan may surprise. Um, I, I don't think it's inevitable that Japanese economy and the GDP should decline with, uh, with a declining population. I think the answer continues to be uh, productivity enhancing uh, reforms. Um, Japan's manufacturing sector has been very productive, but they have a very unproductive service sector in particular in the domestic economy as well. Uh, with the adoption of IT and labor saving automation, those productivity issues can be addressed properly. Uh, and actually still establish, we think, you know, a fairly strong um, outlook for the Japanese economy as well. So uh, we'd sort of gently push back on the idea that, you know, Japanese uh, economic uh, uh, population decline means economic decline. Right. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're coming close to time. So uh, I started out today by saying whether you like sushi or curry, India and Japan should be on your global investment menu. I'd like to invite our panel to uh, make the final closing pitch as to why we should invest in India or Japan. So 30 seconds each. Let's start with Sushan, your closing pitch for India. Yeah, so I think uh, India offers a unique opportunity, especially in the small and mid-sized businesses, where, as I said, the uh, rise in uh, per capita income will lead to disproportionate uh, uh, increase in size of few businesses and probably most of the businesses. And uh, uh, globally, India probably offers that unique opportunity for investors, and especially to invest with the long-term view of 20 and 30 years opportunity, and not just the next two and five years opportunity. Thank you, Sushan. Maya, your 30 seconds on white. Yeah, I think that some people you know, forget about uh, how low base uh, we are starting from for Japan. So the wage growth uh, in two, since 2090, uh, 1990s um, 
the U.S. wage growth was up by 53%. Japan was basically flat. And S&P uh, versus topics in terms of OP margin and ROE, the topic is half of S&P. And, you know, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, actually, uh, the definition of prime market they mentioned is the companies who communicate with global investors. So in light of that, uh, I have invested, um, I, sorry, I have presented uh, to the 100 plus corporate executives in terms of how they can expand their uh, enterprise value upon request. And I think this is uh, actually the sign of change. And, you know, if you, if you are a little bit doubtful, then you can go to Japan and check for yourself because I think that um, you, you, will, you won't be able to enjoy the cheap and overly nice customer service uh, for the sushi omakase, you know, in the uh, near, near future. So, Thank you, Maya. Yeah. Thanks. Anish? Um, I remember one ad from the uh, late 80s for a bike that Honda manufactured with its uh, local uh, partner, Hero. It said, fill it, shut it, forget it. And that's the market for India. I know that's India. You should stay invested for the next 10, 15 years. You're going to have a very good ride as an investor. Thank you, Anish. And uh, take us a finish, Leon. Over three decades of looking at Japan, uh, I've seen plenty of false dawns. Um, however, this time really does feel different. Policymakers uh, at the highest level uh, are driving change uh, as well. That is being met by corporates who are reacting positively to that, to that change as well. Uh, Japan as a stock market remains cheap uh, as well, and there are numerous catalysts ahead uh, for Japan to perform uh, going forward. Right. Thank you very much, Leon. Join me in uh, thanking our panel, and I think uh, we'll come to the end of the, today's...